Okay, hello everybody, welcome. Uh, Joanne Kinsey and I, I am uh, located in uh, Atlantic and Ocean counties and I'm in the Family and Community Health Sciences Department going on 14 years in just another two months. So uh, it's awesome to be able to reach out to the community and we've, in spite of our limitations these days, here we are, we're able to get out there and do our programming too. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is part of a series and tonight we're talking about jams, jellies, preserves and butters as you saw on the title slide. So um, we'll be kind of sticking with that topic for the most part. So here in this slide, you can see uh, the differences between the various products. And, and you probably know most of this. You know, a jelly tends to be more, more clear, more translucent. It doesn't have pieces of fruit in it as a jam or a preserve would have. Um, a jam would have very small pieces of crushed fruit in it, and a preserve may have larger pieces of fruit in it uh, also. A marmalade is uh, actually kind of interesting. It's usually made with a, a citrus and uh, has a really cool taste to it, obviously, and it has uh, more of a, a jelly type of consistency to it. And a, a conserve um, may have nuts and raisins and sometimes coconut in it as well. So that would um, have a totally different texture and have more ingredients in it. Fruit butters are kind of fun. And I'm sure when you go to the market, the supermarket or maybe even a farm market near you, you are familiar with various, um, you know, apple butter, pumpkin butter, so many to choose from. So we'll try to, to touch on a lot of that and give you some information that you could use to uh, start perhaps uh, making some jams or jellies in the future or kind of fine tune what you're doing already just to make sure we're all on the same page and doing all this very safely because food safety is a big issue when it comes to home food preservation. So, um, wait a minute. Okay, one of the, well, the main ingredient in, uh, in your jams or jellies or marmalades is obviously fruit and so it takes a good amount of fruit to do this. The, uh, the fruit actually is what contributes the pectin into uh, the product and helps it to gel. Some fruits have more pectin than others, and we'll look at that a little bit later so you can get an idea. But for the most part, we use an added pectin to help the product to congeal so that it becomes uh, thicker, like spreadable and not liquidy. The, uh, the fruit should be in really good condition, obviously, when, whenever you're doing any kind of um, food preservation, you always want to have your, your product, uh, whether it's for pickling or green beans or corn, and in this case in, with fruit, that it's very fresh, uh, as close to being picked as possible is best and in really good condition. So if we were making peach jam, for example, we would wanna make sure we are not using a bruised peach. And um, you know, we wanna make sure everything is really in top, tip top condition. So it's mostly best to use our fruits when they're just slightly ripe or just slightly underripe because that's when we're gonna have the best product. We're gonna have a good firm consistency to work with and we won't have to worry about bad spots, soft spots, bruises, and that type of thing. So the other, uh, the big ingredient here is sugar. Be and, and sugar's there for, for a couple of reasons. Obviously it adds to the taste and the flavor, but it also helps to work with the pectin in terms of having your product gel so that you have something that's thick and spreadable. When you're looking at a recipe, you don't wanna change it. Don't, don't say, oh, I can add less sugar. We shouldn't be having so much sugar or whatever and thinking, oh, well, I can do that. You can't do that. You need to stick to a recipe um, from an approved source and we'll show you what that's all about in a little while and not make a change to it. If you alter the recipe, 
you're really taking a chance because you're not going to get the product you want in the end. Your jam may not thicken as much as you would like. So it's better not to play with it. Don't change anything in your recipe. Uh, just go with what the recipe says. And in this case, for jams and jellies, you're going to always use your granulated white sugar. Don't change uh, what kind of sugar you're using. Don't use a sugar alternative, or uh, unless your recipe specifically says to do that, you really need to, to stay with white sugar. Brown sugar in this case is not recommended um, and nor is molasses. So, uh, you know, again, stick with recipe and go with it. And when you look at a recipe for jam, if you've never looked at one, you may be a little bit taken back by the amount of sugar that it's going to be using, but that's the recipe and you're going to stick with it. So it does take quite a bit of sugar. So don't be surprised by that. And just like anything else you're doing, you want to be really prepared for this. So you want to read your recipes carefully, make sure you have your ingredients and so on. So let's talk for just a minute about pectin. Um, this is what helps your product to achieve that natural thickness. And as I said before, some fruits have more pectin than others. And so some need more pectin added to get them to the uh, to where we want them to really be. And here you can see that um, that some fruit like uh, that always need pectin there at the bottom would be, you know, if you're working with grapes or pears or figs or something like that, most fruit needs some type of pectin added to it. And that's really important. And we'll show you how to, how to come about getting pectin. So acid is also a part of the combination in most cases when you're working with a jam or jelly. And the acid does help, the, uh, the acidity helps the food to be preserved. And it also helps to preserve the color of whatever you're making so that it still looks nice and vibrant when you go to use it five, six months down the road. So um, acid is, is added typically with some fruits, with, with a lot of them actually in varying amounts and it's not a very high amount. And it could be lemon juice or you could use um, a citric acid and that would be a product that you could buy over the counter that would add the amount of um, acid to get you to the right place. So um, acid also helps with the flavor, as I said, but it also, it kind of enhances the flavor and it also enhances that little bit of tartness that you get from a nice fresh fruit. So let's talk about the gel and how that really comes about. Um, this is really critical, especially when you're making jelly because you have to have your acid and your pectin in the appropriate amount for the product to, to thicken the way we want it to, this is the right proportions. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more down the road. Okay, so there is a test you can do to, to find out if your fruit has enough pectin in it to make a jelly, um, enough natural pectin, or if it needs added pectin. So you know, think about this, is this something that you want to do? Um, and you're certainly welcome to do it. You're also, you know, maybe the easier thing to do is to buy a product um, like Sure Gel and make sure your pectin is going to be appropriate. So here's your little cooking test you can do. It's really just uh, the juice of the fruit and some sugar and you heat it up and then you can see how it, it coats the spoon, and that's that's actually the terminology, how it coats the spoon. Um, if it falls off the spoon, it doesn't have enough pectin in it, natural pectin. If it sort of glops off a little bit, still not really enough pectin. If it stays firm and thick on the spoon, then it's possible that the fruit you're looking to use for your jam or jelly does have enough pectin in it. So there's another test, um, and this one is called the alcohol test. This looks a little strange, I think, when you first look at it. You're going to add 
a teaspoon of the juice of the fruit that you would be working with and a tablespoon of rubbing alcohol. Now this is kind of interesting, right? Have you ever tried this before? Uh, you, you wanna take these two, gently stir them in a, in a closed container, like in a jar with a lid would probably be good. And um, you shake it gently. And if a solid jelly like mass forms that you can pick up with a fork, then there's enough natural pectin present to make this jelly. But don't eat this one. <laughs> Obviously it has rubbing alcohol in it. This is not a taster or a tester. This is just a test if you want to determine how much pectin or the appropriate amount in this particular fruit that you're gonna work with. So what about the acid? There's also a test to see if your fruit has enough acid and then maybe you would not have to add additional acid. So um, in this case, you're gonna take a teaspoon of lemon juice and three tablespoons of water and uh, half a teaspoon of sugar. And you're gonna kind of stir it together and mix it and taste it. If your juice is at least equally tart, then it has enough um, acid to make a jelly. You need a good palate for this one and maybe that test isn't appropriate for everyone. So, but there are other ways to go about getting the pectin. We'll talk about that. If you don't have enough pectin um, and you wanna use a commercial pectin and I, I mentioned Sure Gel, that's just one of uh, several products that are available in the market that you can use. If, uh, if you choose to do that, your commercial pectin um, will call for a full amount of sugar, like kind of a regular recipe. This is the full sugar recipe for your jam or jelly. If you're looking for a low or no sugar product, then you need to make sure you purchase a low or no sugar uh, pectin, added pectin. So this isn't something you take chances with. You need to know what you're going to be making. You know, are you going to make a, a full sugar product? Are you, or are you looking to make a, a low sugar product and you're going to follow the recipe? I probably could say that a million times, right? Okay. Is, is there any advantage or disadvantage to using pectin? So, um, you know, it's, it's really one thing to look at. If you don't have enough pectin, you may have to have a longer boiling time for the fruit and sugar to congeal appropriately to get that texture, you know, that thickness that you're, you're really um, looking for. And then at the same time, if you have to boil the product, the fruit and sugar for too long, it may take away the taste too. So this is why it's really important to follow your recipe. If you're adding, uh, using an added pectin, then you're probably gonna get uh, a greater yield from the recipe. It'll have a better flavor. I mean, if we're gonna take all the time to do this, right? We want the best possible flavor. So we wanna make sure we get that. It will maintain the fresh color and there's less chance of failure. So you may be saying, hmm, what do you mean failure? That means that your product does not uh, gel properly, thicken, or uh, you, you could even have problems with um, the quality of the product down the road. And we don't want that. If you're going to take the time to do this, you want to do it right and, and really you know, get the best out of it. So let's talk about commercial pectins. And you see a couple of different uh, screenshots here of different types of, of pectins that are available on the market. Some are liquid and some are in powder, but they are not interchangeable. So don't think, well, let me use a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one. Does not work that way. Whatever you're using for this particular recipe, make sure you have enough to do your entire recipe. So um, you want to use a fully ripe fruit if you're using uh, a commercial pectin or some fruit that is just slightly underripe works too. And um, you don't have to cook it very much. You'll be really surprised at the amount of cooking time. It's really very low and you don't need to do a test to do the pect to test for pectin. Commercial products uh, like the ones you see there in the picture are really very reliable. They've been tested over and over again and uh, they work. So let's talk about a commercial pectin. This has a shorter cooking time. 
you don't have to test it for doneness as you would when you're cooking some types of foods because you really take into account that the pectin has everything we need to get this product to be uh, a nice quality jam or jelly or butter in the end. So your, your results are gonna be pretty uniform. You know, if you're setting up to make strawberry jam soon and it's time almost to do that. I saw fresh strawberries at a farm market just the other day, it was their first pick and they were very good. So if you're thinking about doing this, you probably need to start getting it in gear and saying, hmm, what do I need? How do I go about everything I need and so on. But using your commercial pectin, which is something you would be having to purchase at a, at a supermarket probably, will help you get the best results. So when you're using a commercial pectin, you can store your jams or jelly in a cool dry place for about a year. And, and they're still good and they're considered safe. And the quality will be as good a year from now as it is the day or the day after you make it. So uh, make sure you don't try to interchange the powdered and the liquid pectins because they, they are not the same. They don't act the same in the products. So we want to make sure that we're going to do this um, in the best possible way. So if you want less sugar, and this is a pretty common question that people ask us, then you need to find a product like the ones you see here on the screen that are prepared for less or no sugar. Um, it's a special product and you need to make sure you read the package for that to get the one you're really looking for. It will say um, light, it'll say no sugar, it'll say less sugar, something like that. And you're going to follow the recipe for that package. The recipe may be a little different from a full pectin recipe, and that's okay. So this is where you need to do a little bit of homework and make sure that uh, you follow these recipes really carefully, read them over. And if you're planning on doing this, I would go out and get your pectin soon, even if you're planning on using it this summer and, um, and look at the inserts for the, whatever type you're using, the, the full pectin or the, or excuse me, the full sugar or the light version with less sugar and read the directions. Make sure you know what you're doing before you get there. And this is a part of that as well. Um, we always talk about being prepared for whatever we're going to be cooking because it saves time and energy and certainly a lot of frustration is having everything ready to go. And when you're going to be making jams or jellies, you're going to need a few things. You're going to need your, your measuring cups um, and your measuring spoons. You're going to need a bowl for sugar. You need a large pot for making the jam and it should be a heavy pot. A light aluminum pot does not work well for, for something like this. So it needs to be a heavy pot. Uh, could be, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the size would it be, uh, maybe a two gallon pot or something like that or a gallon and a half. It has to be a pretty good size. You'll need a ladle and you'll need um, a jar filler or a funnel. These are so, uh, necessary because otherwise you end up with jam or jelly all over the place and that's not a very good idea but a funnel that that fits um, I like the one that I use that fits wide mouth jars or small mouth jars it really helps to keep the jam and jelly going where you want it in the jar and not every place else you'll need some jars and lids and if you're going to embark on this adventure, then you need to be looking for jars in the markets. Um, you can find them in Walmart and in most supermarkets and some lids as well. Um, last year, there was quite a shortage of these, some of these materials. And I, I don't know that, I don't think we're anticipating that this year, but if you're planning on doing some canning, you might wanna purchase these items pretty soon. You're also going to need um, a boiling water, uh, water canner, which you see uh, the picture over there on the right. And uh, the metal insert that sits in there helps the jars to stay in place while they're, they're processing in the, uh, in the boiling water. The, uh, the item you see at the bottom of the screen is a jar lifter. This too, you absolutely need to do this product safely so that you don't get hurt or burnt. These uh, jar lifters are just so handy. They allow you to 
Uh, if you grab them by the top, the black area, you grab uh, that and you can lift up the jar without touching it because your jar is going to be really hot and a little bit difficult to manage. So jar lifters are really very helpful. So other equipment uh, you might want to use for a scale for weighing out your, your produce, your fruit. Uh, sometimes people use sieves or mills if you're making your own juice, um, if you are looking to go more in the jelly direction. Uh, and if you're making a jelly, you're going to need a jelly bag, which you see a picture of here. That way it's kind of straining the, uh, the juice so that you don't have pieces of fruit in it. Remember back to our first slide, your, uh, your jam or preserve has pieces of fruit in it and your jelly does not. It's a little bit more clear. A jelly or a candy thermometer is also very helpful. It'll help you to know when you've reached the gelling point if you're not using an added pectin. A slotted spoon uh, may also be helpful to remove the foam. We'll talk about that later. A foam sort of builds just a little bit at the top of the boiling fruit and you do need to be able to skim that off. So let's see what we need to do here. We're going to start by preparing the fruit. And remember our fruit is, is very fresh. Don't, don't buy it uh, today and then think, oh, well, I'm gonna can it next week sometime. It doesn't work that way. Your fruit needs to be very fresh when you're using, you have to use it immediately because if you refrigerate it too long, longer than a day, you're not gonna have a good product. You're gonna have a fruit that's starting to lose its vibrancy and its flavor and its texture. If, uh, as you're preparing your fruit and getting it together, if you see some pieces that are overripe or have bad spots in them, we are not using them because that will not be good for your, your finished product. You wanna make sure you're using fruit that, it, fruit that is in excellent condition. Remember the fruit can be just a little bit underripe um, if you're doing the no added pectin type of process. And when it, it comes to uh, estimating the amount of fruit, if you buy a pectin product like sure gel, we were looking at some of those products a few, few slides ago, it will tell you uh, in the directions inside how much fruit you need. It'll tell you approximately how much fruit and how much prepared fruit you need. And that's the directions you follow. Very often um, about a pound of prepared, washed, trimmed and cut fruit will equal about one cup of juice. So you can see that you just may need a considerable amount of fruit to make your, your jams or jellies. Um, when you're uh, preparing your fruit, you need to wash it. And uh, if you need to, to take the skin off of it, you can, you can use um, hot water for that, but very, very quickly with something like peaches. But if you, leave, if you leave your fruit in the water too long, the fruit is going to start absorbing the water and you don't want that. You wanna make sure you remove all the stems and blossoms. Um, you're, you're going to um, keep everything as clean as you possibly can. And your fruit is going to be cut up or uh, in the case of uh, jam, blueberry jam, strawberry jam, you're going to take that clean fruit without the stem on it and you're going to put it into a, a food processor and blend it and pulse it a little bit to get to the consistency that your recipe calls for. So you want to make sure you're following what the recipe says. If it says to totally um, liquefy something, your fruit, then that's what you do. If it says to leave it in pieces, then that's what you do. Okay, how about the juice um, and extracting the juice? So you're going to, take your prepared fruit um, and, and clean it obviously. And you're going to have it measured so you know exactly what you're doing and you're gonna put it in, the, in a pan um, on a high heat. And then you're gonna reduce the heat. And when the fruit is soft, um, you're, that's when it's gonna be ready to work with if you're making a juice. So you can see the times here are approximate for grapes and berries, it takes about 10 minutes to get the fruit to the juice stage and apples and hard fruits, obviously they're gonna take a longer time, maybe 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, 
but you don't want to overcook your fruit because that will destroy the natural pectin uh, and the color and flavor of your food. So um, if you're making jelly, you want to dampen your jelly bag with water to have it so that it's not dry. And then you can sort of uh, pour your liquid through it. And you can see here, you can do that, uh, a measuring cup, a large measuring cup. Uh, I use a glass one for something like this or uh, a tall glass of some time that can take the heat or a large jar would be helpful. So you're basically straining out the fruit, the pieces from the juice. Because if you're making a jelly, you wanna end up with just a liquid without pieces in it. So you're going to uh, take good care of that jelly bag as you're doing that. And let's see. So if you're working with grapes, um, grapes are a little bit different in terms of the preparation. You're going to refrigerate that juice overnight and then strain it through two layers of cheesecloth and you're gonna make sure they're dampened. That will give you the best, the best product um, for that. If you're making jelly with uh, no added pectin, then we want to extract the juice to a boil. So um, we're gonna boil it and then we're gonna take that juice. We're gonna add the sugar stirring in until it's resolved, uh, totally dissolved, excuse me. Um, and if there's no recipe, try about three fourths cup of sugar per one cup of juice. That's an approximate lumber, number. It would be better if you follow a recipe, you'll have much better results. And we would really strongly encourage you to follow a recipe that's provided by a source that has done a lot of research on this. You're going to be cooking the juice very quickly. Um, if you cook it too long, you're going to destroy all that natural pectin that would be in the fruit. And then you're gonna test it for doneness to make sure that it's, uh, it's gonna start to get a little bit thickened and it's gonna start to coat a spoon. Remember we talked about that a little bit earlier. So how do you do the test for doneness um, if you're not using an added pectin? Um, what you want to do is uh, cook the, uh, the liquid to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may have to adjust that depending on your altitude. Um, and it would be a little bit of a higher number if you're at a higher altitude. And you need to look that up to make sure you know what you're, what you're doing. And um, once you know what that number is, then you can test the thermometer, use a thermometer to test it um, prior to to, uh, to cooking the jelly. So you wanna make sure your temperature is appropriate and your cooking time is also appropriate. There is a test for doneness without added pectin. And this looks like a slide we saw a little bit earlier, right? How to do this, uh, this sheet test or coat test where you can take a metal spoon and dip it into the boiling jelly and hold the spoon up out of the steam. So you're not gonna hold it over the pot. You're gonna move it away from the pot. So the steam is not uh, liquefying the jelly any more than it needs to be. And you're gonna take a look at what's happening. You know, the, the drops should sheet together. They should come together as sort of uh, one sort of glob coming off of the spoon. And then you know that your pectin has been doing the job that it should be doing in, uh, in getting that product to the proper consistency for you. So there is a, a test for doneness without added pectin and that would be a freezer test. So what you would do is put a small amount of your jelly on a plate and put it in the freezer for just a few minutes and then check to see if it's gelled. You know, Does it have uh, that consistency that it's not liquidy and it has a little give to it? Uh, and you know, it would be pretty much the consistency of a jam, maybe just a little bit thinner at that point. Um, if you think the product has cooked long enough, place it in a small amount on a plate in the freezer. After it's been in for a few minutes, check to see if it has formed a gel. If it has, it's ready. If not, you may need to continue cooking for just a little bit longer. 
So if you're using added pectin, then there is no test for doneness. You don't need to worry about that. The, the products that you use that have added pectin um, are have been tested many, many times, and you're gonna get a really consistent product, a good product every time with that. So you don't need to do this type of testing to see how that works. All you have to do is follow the directions on the package for adding, um, adding the fruit, the, the pectin, the, the boiling time, uh, the settling time, and maybe if you have to skim off the foam, you need to follow the directions. And that's why I'm suggesting that you, uh, if you don't have a, a box of added uh, commercial pectin, you might want to get one and take a look at it before you venture into this project if you've never done it before. So jams and jellies, or excuse me, jams and preserves without added pectin and butters and marmalades, you can do the temperature test um, and you can do the freezer test as well. How about the jars? Okay, a good part of the, of the work when you're canning anything and jams and jellies are no different is preparing your jars and making sure that you have them ready, that they are in really good condition. So um, you have to make sure you have your jars washed and prepared because when you go to fill them, you're gonna do this very quickly and you're gonna have a hot product too. So you want to make sure everything is ready when you get to that, that point. It's best to use pint or half pint or even those small four ounce jars and you do wanna be consistent with that too. If you're going to be doing a whole batch of jam and you know you're gonna use a, a pint jar, then, then do all pint jars with one particular batch and maybe use half pint jars for a second batch if you're gonna do that. For full sugar recipes, you have two options here. You can uh, pre-sterilize the jars before you add your product and then you will be able to process them uh, in the boiling water bath canner for five minutes. Or the second option is not to pre-sterilize the jar, but instead to put your product in a clean hot jar, then process for 10 minutes in a boiling water canner. Now, what's really important there is the boiling water canner is going to help to make sure everything is brought to a very high temperature so that it it makes sure everything um, is safe and is sterilized. So you'll find the ways that work the best for you, but um, it's, it's good to have those jars cleaned ahead of time and get them ready, <laughs> probably in the kitchen, on the counter, ready to go. So to pre-sterilize your jars, and uh, this is a method I, I prefer to use, uh, make sure your, your jars are clean. And if you do a lot of canning, you may be using those jars, you know, year after year. You want to make sure the jars are, are in good condition too, that there's no nicks or, or um, breaks in the glass. So assuming you've already done that, you wash the jars in hot soapy water and you rinse them or you use the dishwasher. And then you're going to cover the jars with water and bring them to a boil and boil for 10 minutes. So, um, that's another thing to consider when you're doing this because this takes a little bit of time because you will need to make sure your jars are ready and hot and sterilized before you get to the point of even working with your jam. Kind of all happens at the same time and it, it's gonna take both hands <laughs> to do all this work. So you're gonna keep these jars in hot water until you're ready to use them. Now keep in mind, you're using boiling water for this. So um, you're gonna be very careful about handling the jars and using jar lifters and tools that will prevent you from getting burnt on your hands. Um, the uh, flat lids no longer need heating. You can, uh, you can just uh, clean them, wash them and use them. It doesn't hurt to put them in boiling water either. Um, that's entirely up to you. So when it comes to the filling of the jars, so you've made your jam um, and it all happens very quickly. You, uh, your directions for jam will say to put your fruit into a pan, bring it to a boil, add the sugar, 
bring it to a, a full rolling boil. That means a boil that can't be stirred down. Um, and oops, I forgot, you probably would have added the pectin in there too already. And you allow it to boil for approximately one minute. Your recipe will tell you exactly, but usually your boiling time is about one minute. So you're gonna make sure you're timing it one minute, allowing it to boil on its own. And then you're gonna remove it from the heat. The, you're gonna remove your product from the heat. Um, and you're gonna take the foam off very quickly. And that's why we could use that slotted spoon we talked about early on as a piece of equipment, because a slotted spoon will help you to just get the foam off without losing too much of your product. Um, what you wanna do is get the foam off very, very quickly. And then um, you can ladle your jam or jelly into a jar and use, a, use your jar filler for holding the hot jar and use a, uh, a funnel that works really well for that. You're gonna leave a quarter inch of head space with jam or jelly. Now, if you've been listening, uh, as we've been talking about canning other foods, you know that the head space would be a little bit more for other food products. For jam and jelly, your head space doesn't have to be quite so much. So it can be a quarter of an inch, can be a little bit more too, and that's okay. You wanna make sure your rims of your jars are wiped clean with a damp paper towel. So um, I always have my damp paper towel ready. And as I fill the jar and I remove the, uh, the funnel and set it in the next jar, then I take that damp paper towel and run around the top of the jar, making sure the jar is fully clean because if it isn't, you just could have a problem with your jar sealing. Then you're gonna put the lid on the jar and use the ring to tighten it till it's fingertip tight. And then you're going to be processing this um, to prevent the growth of mold. And the processing is according to the recipe that you have. Uh, very often it's about five to 10 minutes, depending on the size of the jar. So this is where you need to look at your recipe and understand it ahead of time. So there's no confusion at the last minute in terms of what do I need to do next? Okay, what about processing the jars? Now we have jam in our jars. Jars are very hot and we need to put the jars in the canner that is filled with simmering water. So keep in mind, you need to have all of this going on at the same time. Have that canner uh, with water in it ahead of time, have it already come to a boil and have it simmering so it's ready for you to use your, your uh, jar lifters to take those jars and put them into the water bath camera, canner. You need to be really careful with that because everything is very, very hot at this point in time. Keep your jars upright, don't tilt them. We wanna keep the jam in the jar and not on the lid. So be careful about that. And the amount of water in your water bath canner is usually one to two inches above the top of the jars. So you may need to uh, test that out a little bit ahead of time and say, gee, how much hot water do I need here? And make sure you have it ready to go. Because once we get our, jars in the canner, in the rack, and ready to go, and we bring it to a full boil. We are now on the clock, checking the time for the, uh, the time for the processing. And if the, the jars are pre-sterilized, five minutes will do. If the jars are not pre-sterilized, you can, you'll be uh, boiling them for about 10 minutes. In the end, you wanna turn off the heat and take the lid off the canner and wait about five minutes before removing the jars. And in the bottom uh, picture here, you see a really good shot of the jar lifter. And, and that's why you need the jar lifter because you have boiling water, you have boiling product inside the jar. Everything is super, super hot. Don't try to pick it up with, with just a mitt or something. You need to be using a jar lifter and you need to put those jars on a protected surface. Um, when I'm canning, I have a couple of kitchen towels on the counter to my one side so that when I take the jars out of the canner, I put them on a towel so that I don't damage my, my countertop. 
Um, a long time ago, people used paraffin wax on top of the jars. And this method is no longer recommended. And boy, that's a good thing because I remember using paraffin a couple of times and it just never seemed to work right. So don't uh, don't worry about putting using paraffin. We don't use that anymore. The, me the method of using um, the pectin, the, the commercial pectin is pretty much foolproof if you follow the recipe and the directions really carefully. So now I have these jars, they're hot. They're out of the canner. They're sitting on the counter on top of a dry dish towel. And they need to be, uh, the jars should not be touching each other. And they need to sit there in place, a draft free place for about 12 hours. And that means you don't touch them at all or move them at all for 12 hours. They need to just, to just sit. They need to sit there so that the pectin can do its work and allow the product to gel um, appropriately. So don't skip that step. You can't be uh, moving the jars around. You take them out of the hot processing and right onto the counter. Okay, now what about storage? So you're always going to um, check the seal to make sure it's totally sealed um, after your jars are cold. And what you can do is you can just kind of uh, take the lid and just give it a little tiny press from underneath. And if it's really firm, you're good to go. Then your jars are ready for storage. And remember, we're gonna store them in a cool, dark place um, for, for 12 months and even up to 18 months, but no longer than that. You can remove the ring bands that hold the lid on. You can remove them because you know your seals are checked and you can save them for your next project. It's always good to make sure your jars are labeled with exactly what the contents are, strawberry jam, blueberry jam, whatever, and the date. That way uh, you don't get mixed up down the road in terms of was this last year's jam or this year's jam? So make sure you label everything really appropriately. It'll help you in the long run. Once you have opened a jar of your product that you made, um, you wanna put it in the refrigerator. So if it's, it can sit in the cool dark place for 12 to 18 months, but then as soon as you open it, then you need to be keeping it in the refrigerator. If you, um, if you keep your, your jam for too long of a period of time, it can turn color and the flavor and texture also um, can change. So don't take any chances with that. And if you have any jars that don't seal properly, you know, you go to lift that lid just a little bit and it, it pops right up on you, then you need to get that one into the refrigerator. And that's the first one that you're going to use. That'll be your first jar of jam to use. So what about freezer jam? Um, it's a little bit different in the, in the preparation. Some people like that because I think it tastes more like fresh fruit. You will be using a, uh, an instant or a freezer pectin. So you see the packages here in the page, I'm mean, excuse me, on the screen. They're the types of products you would be looking for. A product that says you're going to be putting this jam in the freezer. Um, you can use uh, sugar or varying amounts of sugar. You need to follow the recipe. Don't make it up yourself. And you want to use a freezer safe glass or plastic. And you want to leave more of a head space, space if you're using your freezer because the food will expand a little bit. So you need about a half inch of head space. Um, these products that you see here, they're really simple and easy to use. And you, there is one that has uh, less sugar amount too. So if you, if you need to uh, use a product with less sugar, do that. So what about storing your freezer jam? You don't put it in the freezer until the gel forms. So you wanna wait until you know that it has gelled and then you store it in a refrigerator or freezer. Uh, do not store it at room temperature because what mold will begin to, to grow very quickly in that product because it was not processed in the boiling water bath. So um, what, whichever way you're going, make sure you follow the recipe, follow directions, and that's the way you're going to do it. 
Um, you can store a, a fresh jam or jelly in the refrigerator for three weeks or, uh, or up to a year in the freezer for the best quality. <clears throat> and again, once you open the product and you go to use it, you wanna keep it in the refrigerator. Also look for the storage directions on the package of the product you're using too. So nothing takes you back to those warm sunny days of summer and fall, like the sweet taste of your own homemade jams, jellies, preserves, and butters. Um, it, it's really a wonderful treat. It makes wonderful gifts if you're interested in doing that. And honestly, making a, a, a gel, jam actually, in my opinion, is probably a very good starting place if you have not done any canning or you haven't done much canning because they're pretty much foolproof, the recipes. If you follow directions and do everything um, the way it says, you should be in really good shape and be really excited about the product you have in the end. So uh, Daryl, I'm gonna turn it back over to you 